Let me thank those who have moved closer to the front. I know as all one comes to speak, it's always a lot easier whenever there's people closer to look at and engage with. And so let me encourage you uh, to engage this morning. Um, I'm not sure if, if all one's going to ask for any group discussion or feedback, but if she does, let's, let's have a bit of um, discussion with our neighbours and, and maybe feeding some stuff back. But let me welcome you this morning. It's great that we're here. It's not as nice as the last number of weeks have been weather-wise, but we're here, we're gathered together to learn from God's word, to encourage one another, to build one another up. And so it's great. I hope you have enjoyed the last uh, number of weeks, if everybody may. This, of course, is our final week, and it's a real pleasure and joy to welcome Dr. Alwyn Mark with us. She is lecturer in practical theology um, in Union. Um, she started Union uh, the same time I did, um, although in a very different role for a very different purpose. Um, but it is great um, that she's with us this morning. And this morning, we're thinking about everybody may be a peacemaker. There are handouts. If you haven't got one, Alistair does have some at the back. Um, do go and get one. But let me open in prayer and then I'm going to hand over um, to Alwyn. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are thankful and grateful for your written word. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in it and also in the person of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're here this morning because we are disciples of Jesus. Lord, we follow our Saviour who is the Prince of Peace. And so we pray that as all one comes to speak to us this morning, Lord, that you would fill her afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would speak through her. Lord, that we would be encouraged. Lord, that we would be challenged and possibly in areas where we need to be corrected. Lord, in your gentleness, Lord, may you correct us. And Lord, we pray that everything that would be said and done would be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It is lovely to be with you here uh, this morning. I believe this is my first time in St. Phil Road, uh, Presbyterian. So, um, yes, thank you, Andrew, for the welcome. And uh, we look forward to your graduation uh, in, in two weeks' time at the college. Um, it's great to be here for the final week of um, Everybody May. And I wonder how many you've made and, and been a part um, of. It's been great, actually, that they've been online, too. So I've been able to, to dip in and out um, of certainly the first two weeks. And thank you to Gordon for his contribution um, to that as well. And I hope and pray as, as we look at this topic in the final week that there will be threads for you that will run through um, all of the weeks, that there'll be things that um, the Lord has to, to teach you um, in each week, but actually there'll be, there'll be th themes for you um, in, in all of the weeks. And uh, the purpose of the weeks um, is, is that we are thinking about what it is to be in Christ, what it is to grow in our faith, what it is to be on this journey of discipleship. And I know you were thinking particularly about discipleship um, last week with, with Rick. But being on this journey towards spiritual maturity, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, as you looked at how, how can we know God through his word? How can we know God through prayer? How can we participate in this life of discipleship? And as we come to this week, I want us to be thinking about particularly how can we participate in life in community uh, together? Um, and we're going to think about this, this theme of being a peacemaker, um, thinking about this life in community, thinking about, particularly about the role of the Spirit in transforming us um, in this, in this, uh, in, into the image of Christ, into what it is to be a peacemaker. And so we're going we're gonna to do a couple of things together this morning. We're going to consider what community is like here in St. Field Road. I know that your strap line is life together um, with Jesus. And so I want you to reflect on what, what is life together? What does that, <clears throat> excuse me, what does that mean? What does that look like for you? Um, we're going to think briefly about how peace is understood within Scripture. 
we're going to spend a little bit of time um, thinking about a passage in, in the book of James, which talks about two wisdoms, two ways um, to live. Um, and then we're going to think a little bit about spiritual transformation and how does that happen? How do we grow in being peacemakers? How do we grow in the spiritual life? Um, and how do we grow in community uh, together? Uh, so I know we've got to a quarter to, it feels like we're going to cover quite, quite a bit, but we'll see how we go and then I think we'll be ready for coffee um, by the end of it. But as we come to uh, think about this together, um, when we think about peacemaking or being a peacekeeper, I wonder how uh, your morning has been when it comes to peacemaking or being a peacekeeper. I wonder how peaceful that has been for you this morning. Um, I know that for this month, 10 o'clock has been an hour earlier than you normally gather, and so that can create certain strains within households. Um, perhaps you've been rushing and wrestling children out. Um, perhaps you've been um, rushing and wrestling a spouse out. Um, I wonder, are you the one that's always ready and waiting to go, or are you the one that's always rushing somebody else to go? Um, we, we see here an illustration of what we might call classic low-grade conflict between siblings. Um, I grew up with five siblings, so I can um, identify somewhat with this. Um, but what we're looking at this morning is not conflict resolution. We're not going to be thinking about complex um, conflicts or how we might solve um, the world's ills or political crisis. We're not even going to be thinking about how do we think about complex breakdowns in relationships. And very aware that <clears throat> when we're thinking about relationships, and particularly breakdown in relationships and strained relationships, there's particular pastoral sensitivity and wisdom that's needed um, in that. What we want to think about this morning is that the idea of peace as a quality of life in the Spirit, as a fruit of the Spirit, as an outcome of the Spirit at work in our life. We want to think what it means to become a peacemaker as part of our journey to spiritual maturity. Again, as I mentioned, your strap line is um, life together with Jesus. And so I want you to take just um, a moment with the, the people beside you, or perhaps you want to, to reflect um, just on your own. What does life together look like in practice for you? What does life together look like in practice for you? Where does community happen here in St. Field Road? Um, and what are the qualities and characteristics of that community life? So I want you to be, if you're talking to your neighbor, I want you to be honest about that. What are the things that mark the community life out here as distinctive? So you're probably part of lots of communities. You may be part of a sports community um, or other communities. If you're at school, you're part of a community. But what is distinctive about community life here at St. Field Road. So think about your community, your context, and what are the distinctions. So take a few moments together just to chat around that.
Okay, we'll have opportunity to reflect on community again at the end um, of our time together. Um, what I want to do is just for us to, to look briefly at where we see peace within um, Scripture, the, uh, the idea of, of peace, how, do we, how is that understood um, within Scripture? Um, in the Old Testament, we see the Hebrew word for peace um, occurs about 250 times in the Old Testament, and it's often associated with the word shalom, or wholeness, or well-being. As a moral quality, it signifies standing against deceit um, and wrongdoing. So we see in Psalm 34, 14, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It's also paired in the Old Testament with justice and with righteousness. So the prophet Isaiah, for example, pronounces sin um, and indicates the absence of of peace, we see there in Isaiah 59, 8, the way of peace they do not know, <clears throat> and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. So there's an absence of peace um, in the pronouncement of sin. Isaiah also points to the, the deliverance that is to come, which is also associated with peace. And we, we, we think of that familiar passage in Isaiah where he talks about the, the coming of the messianic king and the prince of peace. So peace is, is, is associated with justice and with righteousness and is also a marker of the rule of the messianic king. Peace is also paired with God's unfailing love. And so we see in um, Psalm 85, we see an image of God's gracious dealings with his covenant people, even in a time of distress. Let me read these verses for us, which are on the slide. Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, and let them not turn back to folly. So we're going to come and look at this idea of peace and folly. What does it mean to be um, the association between peace and wisdom? Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Here's the association with steadfast love. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. So peace is paired with God's unfailing love. If we look then to the New Testament, we see the emphasis on peace throughout the Gospels and throughout the, the New Testament. Um, peace is evidence of kingdom life. So we think of Jesus' words in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And um, Willard Swartley points out that peacemaking and love of enemy mark identity as God's children. So we reflect God in our peacemaking. And Jesus' followers are to live peaceably. Um, Paul uses peace 44 times in the New Testament, um, and you have a couple of examples there on your handout. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Romans 14, 19, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. And so we want to come back and think particularly about that verse later on. Ephesians 4, 3, um, the, the people of God are so to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 2 Timothy 2, 22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So peace is a gift of Christ. It's a fruit um, of the Spirit, as we see in Galatians 5, 22, where the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
God's purpose in, in giving his peace and in, in giving his spirit, it's an indication of this, this new humanity um, that God has made a way through Christ. Um, through the cross, God has made a way for this new humanity um, to be created. And so an indication of this new humanity is, is peace. So peace, as we see in scriptures, is a central understanding of God's covenant relationship with us, and we are called to be peacemakers. So peace is received as a gift, but it's also something that we are to work out. So if we think about then peace in kingdom life, peace in the life of the Christian, it's a gift that we receive Um, and it's a fruit of the Spirit, but it's also a task. It's something that we're to actively pursue in the moral life. We're to seek peace um, in Christ's body as we witness peace to the world. So in many ways, there's the the personal, there's the peace that we receive through Christ um, as individuals, and there's the peace that we are to um, experience and to work out within community, and then peace then that impacts um, wider into society and the world. Colossians 3, 15 talks about peace in this way. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. So the peace that we've received as a gift, we're to have that rule in our hearts. Um, And then as members of bodies, we are called to peace be peacemakers with uh, one another. We're called to a life of peace. So thinking about then becoming a peacemaker in um, St. Field Road, I want us to, to move into time of discussion based on a passage that we read in the book of James. So again, thinking about peace in the New Testament, this is one example of where we see Um, peace in the New Testament. And this connection between peace and wisdom, again, we see that in the Old Testament in Proverbs 3, verse 17. It says, her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. So wisdom and peace is something, again, that we see um, carried through from the Old Testament. But in these verses in um, James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, which we're going to read together and also on your handout. Um, James is a, is a letter that's very concerned with practical Christian living. Um, so what does it mean for a genuine faith to be worked out in how we live? What does it mean for faith and action to go together? And just after these verses um, that you have on your handout, James poses two rhetorical questions questions to the community to which he writes. And the two questions are this, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So James is highlighting something specifically to the communities to which he is writing, um, and he's highlighting a problem, and the solution is, is being people who are peacemakers. Now, he seems to be referring in these questions to um, verbal conflicts. And if you know the book of James, you remember what James chapter 3 talks about, the power of the tongue and the importance of what we say and our speech, that from the tongue can come both blessings and curses. Um, So it seems to indicate from these questions that there's there's some sort of um, verbal conflict happening here. But this, if we look then to the verses before, which is what we want to focus on, James is talking about two different types of wisdom. Um, So let me read these verses for us. James 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, 
open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So this passage is just before these two questions um, that James is, is posing. So what I want you to do is, is to think about these two types of wisdom. What are the characteristics that James is pointing to in these two types of wisdom? Uh, there, seems to be a, there seems to be a worldly wisdom that James is talking about here, and then a heavenly wisdom, which is from um, above. So think about the the wisdom, the two different types of wisdom, and then take it a step further and think about how might that impact a community? How might those two different types of wisdom impact um, community life? What might the results of those be? Um, So again, take a a moment with your neighbor from those verses that you have there, James 3, 13 to 18, um, and think about what those two different types of wisdom um, are. Okay, let's have a think then about what, identify what those different types of peace are, and then 
um, I want to just reflect, maybe picking up some of the things that you've been thinking about of how those might outwork within the life of the Christian community. Um, so these are, these are what James is pointing to in terms of worldly wisdom and heavenly uh, wisdom. So worldly wisdom, bitter jealousy and, and selfish ambition. And we see then in, in um, chapter four, moves on to thinking about how that might be worked out within um, the community or the, the, the fruit of that type of wisdom within the community. Then heavenly wisdom is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. When we think about the Christian life, there's a picture again that we get in the New Testament of putting um, off the old life and putting on the new life. So putting off the old self, laying that aside and putting on the new self. And we see that in, in Colossians 3, that picture, and we'll look at those verses in a moment. But again, if we're thinking about this worldly wisdom and this heavenly wisdom, if we're to put off this worldly wisdom and put on um, this heavenly wisdom, this new self. The passions that are at war um, that James seems to be indicating to um, indicates that there's, a, there's this ongoing wrestle in the Christian life between the old self and the new self in the spirit. And so we're to put off this old self and put on this new self. But I wonder what um, this old self might look like or how it might be reflected in Christian community? Where might envy or selfish ambition or um, self-centeredness be evident in Christian community? Um, let me just suggest a couple of things um, and uh, we, can, we can then think about what the new self is. So perhaps wanting to get your own way in Christian community or having things done in the way that you like um, maybe wishing God had given you a certain gift when you look at others, um, or you wishing you could do that role rather than the person who's doing it. Maybe not wanting to listen to another way of thinking or doing things. Um, perhaps it's being overly critical of the way things are done. Um, perhaps being resistant to new ideas or even to new people because it unsettles and changes things. Um, perhaps it's a lack of gratitude. Perhaps it's a criticalness. Um, again, James talks about the carefulness of our words. We need to be careful about how we speak about our Christian brothers and sisters um, and how we speak about our Christian community. So those might be things that are associated with worldly wisdom. What about this new self that we are to put on? Um, being kind, um, being willing to yield to others. And again, when we talk about yielding, it's not, it's not about um, giving in if it's an important part of, of a, a Christian principle that, that matters. It doesn't mean that we give in to those necessarily. But it's being willing to defer to others on matters that are not um, perhaps so important. Um, it's being merciful, it's loving our neighbor, um, it's loving our neighbor in action. Um, we see again in James chapter two, the sin of partiality where we show favoritism um, and he gives the picture of the rich man and the poor man. Um, do we show, um, um, are we impartial in that? Are we sincere, again, this, this idea of being sincere in our words. Do we say what we mean? Um, and then do we carry that out? Are we careful with what we say? Um, and um, are we sincere in our words to others? Do we build one another up in our words rather than tear one another down? So a few thoughts on what, how that might um, outwork, that worldly wisdom and that heavenly wisdom how that might work out in practice. And then we come to this verse 18 that we see at the end of this passage. Um, and the, the NIV translation of that is, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Um, and so as we think about everybody may be a peacemaker, um, we're, again, we're, we're thinking about peace as a gift of the Spirit, but also something that we outwork in the Christian life. 
Um, and so as we think about the Christian life and we think about the moral life, we think about um, not only conduct, so what is the right thing to do, but we think about what is, what is the, who am I to be? What is it to live a godly life? How do I be a godly person? So we're concerned not just with conduct, but we're also concerned with character. We're concerned about the people that we are becoming. So if we, are to, if we are to live into a life of spiritual maturity, we need to think about the choices that we're making, um, but also the people that we are becoming. Um, and so I wanted to, to, just to think about this little diagram at the moment, and I hope this will be helpful um, to us as we think about uh, becoming um, who Christ has called us uh, to be. So we think about spiritual transformation, we understand that the Holy Spirit indwells in us, that the Spirit is at work in our lives to help us as Christ's disciples to become more like Christ. And we understand that as a process of sanctification, that we are, that gift is a grace, is it, is, grace is a gift to us, but that we are also working out that, that gift, and we do that with the work and help of the Holy Spirit. So the journey of um, that is, is, uh, is, a, is a gift of the, the, is a work of the Spirit in our lives, but it's also a task that we are um, to be active in. So the first stage there in that making wise choices, living a life of obedience, we're to live a life that actively pursues um, obedience and godliness. Again, this idea of putting off and putting on, moving away from sin and moving more fully into the life that Christ has called us to. So making uh, choices that are pure, that are peaceable, that are gentle, that are open to reason, that are full of mercy, good fruit, that are impartial and sincere. So living a life of obedience is about um, our behavior. Then we see um, the, the second stage in that of repeating those choices. Um, so the first stage, we can, we can think of this idea of, of following Christ, being obedient to his words. John 14, uh, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Um, and we walk in step with the Spirit. But the life of um, the disciple is about repeating those choices. Eugene Peterson talks about discipleship as a long obedience in the same direction. So it doesn't just take one good choice to make a person of character. It takes a thousand small choices to become a person of character. And uh, somebody described that as holy sweat. And I, I thought that was quite a helpful illustration. I don't know if there's any marathon runners here or any sports people, but if you want to be a marathon runner, it doesn't just take um, one quick jog around the block. It takes sweat. And if we want to live um, into the, the life that Christ has called us to, um, and that the Spirit is enabling us to as well, then we need to make wise choices um, repeatedly. And we do that by abiding in Christ. We do that by drawing near to God and God drawing near to us. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity noted that every time you make a choice, you're turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. So choices shape habits and habits shape character. Choices shape habits and habits shape character. So we make wise choices, we repeat those choices, we become a certain type of person, and that leads to character. And so then we see that the third stage there, that's we become spiritually mature. We are shaped into the image of Christ. We live out a life that brings glory to God. And so as we think about this everybody may journey, we, you thought last week about discipleship, that when it comes to thinking about spiritual transformation and the moral life, we're all on that journey. And of course, this side um, of eternity will not reach perfection, but there's, a, there's a, a holy sweat that we're called to in the Christian life and in community. Um, 
And so we need to remember that peacemakers are formed in community, that we're called to live in community, um, and that actually the process of sanctification is, is, is worked out in community. Um, and also peacemakers transform community. So as you become more like Christ in your attitudes and your actions, you will shape and impact the Christian community in which you live. So peacemakers are formed in community and transform community. So as we come to um, thinking towards the impact then that this has within this community um, in St. Field Road and this idea of life together with Jesus, um, I want you to take a few moments again together or by yourself to think about what positive steps can you take to be a peacemaker and build a community of peace and mutual upbuilding. So thinking about putting off this old life, putting on this new life, what steps, what practical steps can you take um, to build a community of peace and mutual upbuilding here in St. Field Road? So take a few moments together to, to think about that.
Okay, this is something that you can continue in your conversations over coffee and perhaps even today, thinking of something really practical that you can do. Um, I know you're having a, a lunch together afterwards. Is there something really practical that you can do um, to build a community of peace here at St. Field Road and to um, mutually upbuild one another? Even thinking about that's what James says about our tongue and our words and the importance um, of that. Let me just read these verses from, um, from Colossians. Again, this, this putting off the old and putting on the new. Um, Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you all also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Yeah, I want to finish our time together with a, with a prayer that um, is, a, is a prayer about God's peace. And it's a familiar, you'll be familiar with the, the words of it. Um, from Francis of Assisi, and it's a, it's, it's a, a reworking of, of um, his, what he says about being instruments of God's peace. So let's um, allow the, the Lord to, to speak to us as we pray this together, as we pray this over um, our community um, as, as Christians, and as we, as we ask the Lord what our role is as peacemakers. So let, let us pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where hate rules, let me bring love. Where malice, forgiveness. Where disputes, reconciliation. Where error, truth. Where doubt, belief. Where despair, hope, where darkness, thy light, where sorrow, joy. O Master, let me strive more to comfort others than to be comforted, to understand others than to be understood, to love others more than to be loved. For he who gives, receives. He who forgets himself finds. He who forgives receives forgiveness. And dying, we rise again to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be with you. And um, I hope that what we have looked at today will be um, seen in, in the fruit of your community life together. And I look forward to staying on for, for your service. Thank you.